Hello, this is Greg Smalley on Pod 366, a weird movies podcast. Joined today by Penguin Peach. Penguin Peach. And later we will be joined by uh, Giles Edwards from Montreal. And with him, our special guest, Nina Martin, who is a professor of film studies at Connecticut College and the author of... What's it called? Sexy Thrills, Undressing the Erotic Thriller. And oh. uh, unfortunately for us, we are not going to discuss the um, erotic thrillers, which would be a great topic for another day, perhaps. Uh -huh. uh, Pete, how is everything in Ohio? Or Ohio, Iowa. Iowa, Iowa. Iowa. We're here, we're here. Uh, we, we did have our storms uh, go through last night, and uh, two of our pine trees finally blew over oh on our property. So we had to get the guys out here with chainsaws in the morning to clear the street. <laughs> but we were quite lucky because uh, because uh, the pine trees fell in such a way they didn't hurt anything. But uh, still, I'm going to miss those. I'm going to miss those trees, and the squirrels will miss them too. Uh, there is one flattened squirrel, for those of you who like the dark comedy, who was flattened in the street. Uh, he he took us home down with him, so so he rode it all the way down. They scooped that up too. But anyway, we chainsawed away the tree, and uh, there's still mostly a tree taking up my yard now. But uh, they'll be back Monday for the rest of that. So that was storm season here in Des Moines, Iowa. In uh, just one day, bit of synchronicity. The uh, same thing happened at my father's house. Lightning strike took down a tree and also uh, fried his computer. Uh, oh, it's so close uh, that it fried his computer. Ah, and then he contracted COVID and has to isolate with no computer. Oh, 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 and no oh. T no cable either. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Um, but let's get into uh, let's get out of the bad weather news and let's get into today's. Movie news and releases, and we're going to start out with a bit of odd news. <laughs> um, Pete, why don't you describe what you see? I would be honored. <laughs> uh, this is a computer animation. Uh, looks like it was filmed in... Something like uh, uh, mach uh, Mecha Machine Animation, as it's called, uh, filmed in a, a video game engine, perhaps, like uh, like the Half-Life engine. Uh, and it's a row of urinals uh, on a wall with uh, two heads poking out of them with absolutely manic grins on these faces, uh, poking out of two out of three urinals. And... Um, and this is Skibidi Toilets. All right. I believe it. Yes. And now, Pete, had you ever heard of Skibidi Toilet before this week? I think I have actually. Uh, I've heard of the word sp Skibidi going around. Generation Z uh, uh, popularized that one on places like uh, on, on TikTok and Discord and whatnot. And it's generally a nonsense word that kind of means whatever you want it to mean, but it's also. Uh, as I understand it, it's kind of uh, taken on a uh, a cultural in signal, like uh, like like you talk about skibidi, like like us two know what we're talking about, but the outsiders don't. You know, it's kind of like that. It's a word to confuse outsiders. So, it's it's a word to make the squares <laughs> uh, cringe. So, yeah. uh, however, it's now been adopted into this thing, which is kind of a, a viral internet sensation. There's been a few videos. Going around with that, so uh, I'd say so, more, yeah, than that's... Few, more than a few videos. There's like seventy of them. Oh, uh, 70 now, of eighty now, of course. them. Uh, oh, I'm sure the world needed every bit of those, not one less. So this is something that you know, if you're um, a, if you're under fifteen, you probably know what you're looking at, and if you're over 15, you are probably distressed and uh, freaking out. Um, <laughs> We've seen worse. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, essentially, these are YouTubes in which it's a running series. These guys 
poke their heads out of various toilets and sing. And uh, there's uh, over time some sort of narrative develops that they're being opposed. They're aliens who are invading Earth and they're being opposed by Earthlings who don't actually look like Earthlings but have megaphones or cameras for heads. And uh, apparently it's a whole big thing. Um, and it's something we might have just entirely overlooked until Variety ran a piece saying that uh, Paramount wants to option this, license this IP. And even, even rumors that Michael Bay, of all people, would direct a movie. Well, there goes the franchise. Uh, it almost sounds like April Fool's Day came early, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the Michael Bay detail is uh, is, is pretty precious, so so uh, that that kind of suits it, I guess. <laughs> what would Michael Bay do with what's essentially a completely absurdist little prank meme thing? I mean, I guess he took a toy franchise and made it into an awful movie franchise, so... Yeah, so... I mean, maybe he so. could do something awful with this, too. Yeah, but, you know, there's nowhere to go from here, but almost, almost nowhere to go but up. I, I guess if, uh, hmm... I, I guess if you mixed in some cocaine bear or Sharknado or something into Skibidi Toilet, you, you, could, you could make it a little less comprehensible, perhaps, but... I'm cool. I'm cool with Skibidi Toilet as it is. I don't think it needs a... Uh, Maybe mix in some steamed hams from last year's internet meme. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, that's probably enough of that because if you're, like I said, if you're 20 or above, you probably have no idea what's going on here. So let's just move on to some other things. Describe oh. this next still we're looking at here, if you would, Pete. Well, I think I recognize this. This is a, a red-haired woman in a blue dress, clenching her fists and screaming with all of her passion so badly that the uh, surrounding uh, crowd of bald men are all gripping their ears in in pain. <laughs> and um, this is this is one that I saw um, uh, right when it came out. As a matter of fact, I've uh, I've always liked it, and I'm kind of puzzled why there weren't. More movies that followed it instead. It's pretty unique. I mean, do uh, you still see the still? Yeah. It's a pretty unique movie, so I'm I'm not sure. I'd Run Lola Run 2 probably wouldn't have worked. Uh, no. Although, who knows what they could have done with it. So anyway, but, uh... it's its 25th anniversary, and... Um, uh, Tickwer, the director, Tom Tickwer, uh, had a pretty long interview that we linked on our Run Lola Run page because Run Lola Run is one of our 366 canonically weird movies. Um, so you can find a link to an interview with him. This release on 4K Ultra HD only, not on Blu ray. Um, is to celebrate the 25th anniversary. It has some special features that I think were on older uh, releases. Um, it's a very good movie. Uh, Pete likes it. You've probably seen it. If you have a 4K player, you can now buy it that way. Yep. Any further thoughts? Well, yeah. Um, I remember uh, in the in our review, or even in the original uh, interview with the director, they were talking about and described it as a kinetic movie. And um, not to spoil too much, but the narrative is kind of a forked narrative, uh, in the same vein as the way Quentin Tarantino movies play around with the timeline and uh, show scenes out of order. This is this is similar to that. This is like uh, this is like the story continues through several alternative universes so you can pick the one that you like as uh, as as the as the uh, as the story that you that you 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 know best suits but it shows all of them at the same time that's what i mean um narrative structure is a very interesting thing that i think a lot of movies don't innovate with 
Uh, there is Inevitable, which shows a story in reverse order. Uh, Tarantino, as I mentioned, uh, has this interwoven, uh, what I call a braided narrative, because it's the uh, different uh, scenes keep coming back from different characters' perspectives. Um, especially did that in Jackie Brown. Um, let's see here. There's there's just different uh, different ways to tell a story besides just just going a three act structure with a beginning and a middle and an end and a denouement. You know, so um, if I'm pronouncing the French word right. But anyway, so that, that's what I mean. But I'm surprised that uh, it didn't really kick off a, uh, a a a string of the usual copycats that you would expect from a successful experimental film. So, but we're we're still kind of looking at, and I bet there's there, there, there's few any movies out there that are playing around with narrative structure more. So, sure, there there are always plenty. And by definition, movies that play around with narrative structure have to be a tiny sliver of the whole, because otherwise there would be no narrative structure to you know, no accepted narrative structure to play around with. So. Yeah. But like, you know, what if you did the opposite of Run, Lola, Run, where you had one ending, but there were five possible beginnings? <laughs> there ah! you go, now, see? You, you gotta, see, nobody's done that. That's a million-dollar idea you just gave away for free. But uh, Oh, I, I do it all the time. All right. Well, speaking of something you should be doing all the time, does describing this next picture it's not really still but uh looks like a dvd case really um or or the case for the blu-ray or uh, or whatever whatever edition this is but it's uh it's got the title in big uh painted letters of green on a pink background called i saw the tv glow and it's also uh the insert of the case is showing a scene from the movie a uh, very blue washed scene and this is the one we covered a while back with the uh, with the uh, uh, various characters who saw a TV show in their childhood, and then came back together as adults to discover that there was more to the original TV show than than uh, than one would expect. I guess is yeah. a you know, caps like that. That's pretty much it. This okay. Is, um, so it's being released on Blu-ray, but this is a special edition this is before the um there will be another release that will be more available to people this is the a24 exclusive special release uh, which they sometimes huh. do they did this for midsummer i think they've done it for other movies uh so you can only buy it from a24 which sucks because they don't give us you know cut on that uh, so um but it's a nice looking package as you can see from the still if you're able to see it and it comes with six postcard type art pieces art cards that are going to be the collectible element that's not going to be in future releases is my guess uh, that's going to be the exclusive item uh, the other stuff which are like you know the regular uh, features like the commentary with Jane Schoen director Jane Schoenbrunn and star Brigitte Lundy Payne um, a featurette and some behind the scenes stuff that will probably be on the regular commercial DVD our Blu-ray when it gets released. Uh, but for people who are super fans, go to A24 and you can buy this special edition. And I know the fans are out there because I saw this movie go viral on Twitter when it broke at the festival. Who oh boy. Yeah. Well, uh, I recommend you see it, Pete. That's uh, it's really very good. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, 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 I will check it out as soon as I can. It's on the list. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've checked this one out, but uh, at least describe what we're looking at for our listeners only. Um. All right. Well, this is the uh, title poster of a movie, and we've got a character who resembles an adult Shirley Temple in a fur coat, red dress, blonde hair, um, makeup on, and um, <clears throat> waving. 
And next to her, we have a character that very much resembles, say, Michael Jackson during his later years when he was running around in a mask and sunglasses and hat all the time uh, in a uh, 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 military-ish kind of uh, outfit. And both of them are riding in the prow of what looks like a rowboat. <clears throat> and this is Mr. Lonely, which is by the director of Gummo, is it? Yeah. Yes, indeed, Gummo. Very, very, very famous in weird movie circles. Uh, however, this is nothing like Gummo. Um, I did check out the premise of it, and uh, it's kind of cute. It's kind of like this uh, uh, isolated island where basically a bunch of cosplayers go to play their the personality that they have uh, they've adopted in perpetuity. So there's one character who's who poses the queen. Um, I imagine there's there, there's just various celebrity impersonators that are running around in the story. But uh, that's all I know about it, from, uh, and that's all I'm picking up from the trailer so far. So very interesting. Yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. It's a so uh, uh, Harmony Korine uh, directed uh, Gummo, and uh, he had written Kids before, and I believe. Oh, he did a movie in between called Julian Donkey Boy. And then he done, so he'd done, he was young, he'd done, directed two movies, written another movie, uh, and he got some money from a studio to make a movie. So he made what for him would be a mainstream movie, uh, a movie about a, a Michael Jackson impersonator who is recruited by a Marilyn Monroe impersonator to oh. live on an island of uh, celebrity impersonators. Uh, okay. Which is a pretty eccentric premise, I would say. Very much so. Film. But uh, also very, uh, very current to our times when so many people now um, uh, on uh, influencers on Instagram make their whole thing cosplay uh, cosplay is huge at every convention out there. And I think our modern times, our internet age, combined with a lot of the isolation from COVID, has led to uh, this being one of the few pastimes that people can engage in, you know, without judgment or guilt. They can, uh, as, as a vice would be, uh, you know, to, uh, to impersonate another character and play that character. So, and you know, speaking of somebody who, of course, never never attends a Renaissance fair without doing my wizard bit, of course, I I can identify too. It's it's good, clean, wholesome fun, and it's uh it's the kind of thing that uh, really has a whole culture behind it. So um so the time for this movie is now. Well, maybe that's why it's <laughs> coming back. Um, there is a subplot to the. I haven't seen the movie, so I'm going off descriptions. But in the trailer. You might have noticed Werner Herzog. Uh, he is running around in a subplot uh, involving flying nuns. So <laughs> say it's not weird by Harmony Korine standards, but it was too weird for the multiplex, and uh, it failed. It was it was a financial and critical failure. And uh, I think Harmony Corrine got very disillusioned from his experience with this movie. And so the next thing he made was Trash Humpers, which was <laughs> uh, the opposite of a big budget Hollywood movie uh, in every way, possible way he could make it. Wow. So this movie is responsible for trash humpers if you like or dislike trash humpers. And it's it's probably something worth checking out. I haven't seen it. Pete obviously hasn't seen it. And speaking of things we haven't seen, we got uh, two more to cover. What's this one, this still, Pete? Oh, uh, looks like, uh, well, it's three people out in the woods and they're all... Uh, standing facing each other, three people in a triangle or facing each other, and each of them are doing strange poses and hand gestures as if they were practicing Tai Chi or something, perhaps. Um, I, I, it looks familiar, but the trailer didn't really... Um, let's see here. Process of elimination. 
It's got to be either moon blue or, yeah, it's got to be moon to the moon. To the moon is the correct title, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, from uh, <clears throat> this is uh, one that's coming pretty much directly to Blu-ray from Yellow Veil. I think it was at some festivals and probably had some sort of token uh, theatrical release, but this is pretty much the first we've seen of it. I do not believe it's available streaming anywhere. Um, it's called To the Moon. The uh, premise is a TV actor is an addict. He goes home to try to detox with his wife, but his estranged brother shows up and uh, he starts to hallucinate from his drug withdrawals. So then we wonder if maybe the brother is a hallucination. One of those psychological thrillers where you can't tell, uh, you know, dreams from reality, plays around with that whole thing. Um, and who knows? Could be weird. <laughs> we don't know whether it's, you know, it's definitely going to be in the weird genre. We don't know if it's going to be a sleeper, a unknown gym, or just a typical, uh, you know, mediocre effort in this genre. We have no idea. The one good thing it has behind it, I think, is that Yellow Veil uh, produced it and promoted it, and they generally do good stuff. So that's that yep. one. And yeah, um, I'm. I it looked like a good quality movie to me, and uh, and the trailer plays well, and it's certainly of interest to weird fans. But I didn't really pick up anything that I haven't, I haven't frankly seen before in a hundred and one <laughs> movies about drugs, detoxing, hallucinating, etc. So, it, it, but it looks like it has some humor to it too. No, so the acting looked uh, looked pretty good. The uh... Two guys were well cast as brothers where you almost think they're the same guy with slightly different beard style. <laughs> um, and it looks like it leans heavily on the drama also. There were some dramatic moments. Uh, so yeah. it could be just a quality movie that uh, has trouble finding sort of a genre and an audience. Uh, just guessing there, though. But offbeat. One last thing uh, that we know almost nothing about um go ahead pete tell us what we're looking at if you would oh uh, this is an anime uh cover and it's for urusi i believe and it's got a panoply of characters on it including a blue-haired uh bikinied waif taking the foreground and waving and a bunch of other characters variously gesticulating in a huge mob around <laughs> around the background, I guess. Yeah. So um so yeah, it looks looks like a looks like a scoop of crunchy roll for lunch. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, like a sushi <laughs> arrangement, maybe. Uh yeah. Ur I pronounce it Urusei Yatsura. Yeah, that's probably close. I'm well known for massacring uh, pronunciations of. I'll join the club. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Not familiar with this one at all. Like I uh, like I say about anime, you could you could watch a different anime series every day of your life, and still have only seen a tiny corner of anime in your lifetime. So, so uh, there's hundreds of series out there. I guess this one is apparently uh, apparently attracting a little more attention on the uh, weird radar. Yes, so, okay, this series was, I think, and probably, I'm going to probably misspeak, and people will correct me on these details, so let me preface this with these details are sketchy. Uh, probably its series began in the late 80s, uh, and it is features a uh, flying alien in a bikini, hot flying alien in a bikini, who uh, becomes, in a way, through a uh, contrivance, uh, falls in love with this human boy 
who uh, is more of a wants to play the field while she thinks they're they should be exclusive. And that's the kind of romantic comedy element. But then they have all sorts of fantastical uh, adventures across the universe and stuff like that. And it's all pretty uh, PG-13. They did the finish the original run. They did a series of movies, one of which is a canonically weird movie, and that is uh, the number two movie, Urusei Yatsura 2, Beautiful Dreamer, which just happened to be uh, directed by Mamoru Osh Oshii, who okay. you may know uh, as the... Uh, director of, uh, among other things, Ghost in the Shell. Ah. So he went on to bigger things after this. He also did a surrealist anime that has been kind of lost called uh, Angel's Egg. And in Beautiful Dreamer 2, sort of a psychological thriller dream plot set in this world which is simultaneously the kids' romantic comedy world. Uh, and so it ends up being very weird. Uh, somebody has also recommended the fourth movie in the series as a weird movie. But these all ended, and I should say, uh, I said it was in the late 80s. They were probably in the early 80s because uh, now that I see Beautiful Dreamer is from 84. Um, and that's the second movie after the, so now they've come back. So now it's like uh, 40 years later, they've released some OVAs. I believe there are 11 episodes in this and we don't really have much idea about it, except they brought back the old uh, characters and uh, plot say that there are things in it like dreams, bad cooking, Sherbert, some ninjas and uh, growth of body hair, uncontrolled growth of body hair. Um, so no idea if these are closer to the spirit of the original series, which is more comic and uh, probably aimed at a uh, pretty young audience, or if they're more like some of the more challenging movies in the series. Uh, it's a very long and complicated and rich series. As most animes are. <laughs> yes. Lots of lore, <clears throat> as the boys, kids say nowadays. Uh, that's the trendy buzzword. Um, so I think that about does it. Uh, oh. Do you have anything to add from this week, movie? No, nah, not much. Uh, we we do have Giles at the festival and uh, Nina here. We we have Giles and in the market, so uh, let's just uh, pause or stop this session, and we will join them. How's that sound? Oh yeah, some memorial for uh, for Mister Edwards' cat, perhaps. Um, you're you're saying perhaps later. Uh, oh, okay. At the end, uh, um, so uh, let's uh, pause right now. No time will pass for you. We will join back with Giles Edwards and Nina Martin from Montreal. Hello, this is Greg Smalley back on Pod 366, joined again by Pete Turbovich. Joined from Montreal by the guy you know, Giles Edwards, and our guest this week sitting on the couch next to Giles is Nina Martin, Associate Professor of Film Studies at Connecticut College and author of Sexy Thrills, Undressing the Erotic Thriller, and she also posts film reviews on her personal blog, I Wear Black on the Outside, which we will link. Hi, Nina. Hi, nice to be with all you weird people. <laughs> also a uh, Fantasia uh, enthusiast, I suppose. Absolutely. Love it. Um, so we're going to talk about 
let's talk about the movies that Giles uh, has highlighted, and we'll talk about some other movies maybe that he hasn't highlighted. Um, but first off, Nina, just asking you, are you just there as a fan? Or are you there connecting, networking, doing research? Or have you just, is this just vacation? Well, I am a fan. I'm always a fan, but I'm invested in writing about women directors. And they had a women directors panel here at the festival with a woman named Heidi Honeycutt. And I'm going to plug her book, I Spit on Your Celluloid, which is a history of women directors of horror. So I got to meet her and a bunch of other women who are horror filmmakers on the panel. And I really feel like Fantasia is a great place to meet people. That's where I met Giles. This is true. Yes. Uh, in, the, in the press line before the uh, dark days of the lockdown remote era, Nina was a, a regular uh, chatting companion for me and a handful of the and other people that I look forward to seeing through seeing here each year. So it's a yearly you're, you're both yearly uh, uh, pilgrims. Yes. As po yes, whenever possible. All right. Um, actually, before we start, I'd, let me ask Pete if he has any questions he wants to get out of the way, or we should just dive into the movies. Oh, we can we, we can dive in. Um, hmm, there's there's a hundred things that I could ask to validate ask an associate professor of film studies to validate my own pet theories, but uh, <laughs> I'll spare you on that. I'm, I'll, I'll spare you on that. I did dive into the rabbit hole on your blog, however, but catching up, you've been on Blogspot since 2012. I know. And, uh, <laughs> <game> yeah. <forever. laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's a shame we're seeing the blog era come to an end like it is, but, uh, but uh, uh, sites like that are so rare now. And of course ours is, 366 Weird's been around since, oh, I think since blog story, like the 2000s. 2000. But anyway, we'll just let things come along. So these two are currently at Fantasia, which is winding down. You've got, uh, I don't know, half a week left. So mm -hmm. you've had time to get a lot of movies under your belt. And Giles has written about several of them. He's written about many in just uh, sort of an omnibus uh, post, but there are eight movies that he's given full length recommendations to. Wow, that's a lot. And, uh, we should go through those and see if Nina has seen them as well and if she has concurs or has any thoughts. Um, and if not, it's perfectly fine because there are hundreds of movies playing there and people can't all be expected to see the same ones. Uh, but the first, the earliest one Giles highlighted was Mononoke, the movie. Didn't, didn't see it. Didn't see that. <laughs> That's a, uh, that was an anime, right? Yep. Next one, Animalia Paradoxa. Oh, yes. Saw that. What did you think of that one? Amazing. I loved it. I mean, it's grimy. It, it's got this kind of tactile experience when you're watching it where there's a lot of, I don't know how you pronounce it, detritus, yeah. detritus? Yeah, one of those two pronunciations. One of those, um, just scattered all over the mise-en-scene. And there is a genderless character yeah. That, yeah. that's roaming around, kind of filthy, kind of i mean it's a post-apocalyptic wasteland so they are wearing a gas mask of sorts and covered in grime and they feed little toy objects to this extremely hairy thing hmm. who gives them sweats some kind of glittery goo that the character bathes in i mean yeah it's abject <laughs> Majorly, yeah, it's uh, implied and growing evidence uh, develops that this this uh, main creature protagonist is perhaps semi amphibious or certainly would prefer to be so. Has set up a a very basic uh, sort of bath thing that uh, this 
precious fluid is accumulated in, and there are one or two scenes showing this entity kind of maximizing their exposure to the yeah. whatever that liquid is, um, which is yeah. Um, there's actually yeah. There's one more step because uh, she uh, the the creature collects these trinkets or makes these trinkets from the junk that's all around, hands them to this hand that is emerging right. from a hole in the wall. <laughs> and I guess if they're judged worthy, what's returned really looks to me like a, a gummy worm. Yes. And this gummy worm in turn is fed to this uh, hairy. other entity, hairy entity that's like in this massive web of its uh, own hair. And yes, yeah, somehow perspires or otherwise excretes. excretes this fluid. We don't really see because we see the thing fed. There's some weird Foley design muttering. And then the next shot is much lower on this with, uh, near toward the bottom of locks of hair with, you know, the, uh, the fluid dripping down it. So uh, as I mentioned in my review, one of the handfuls of movies that I could even think uh, for this was uh, Begotten because uh, it has not as much of a timeless lost look, but something close to it. Yep. And uh, Poseidon Hotel, just for the liquid combo with Detritus, uh, appearance that is throughout the feature except in the documentary things that uh, crop up every now and again so that's got to be the weirdest thing at the festival and i can't imagine that being dethroned in Definitely the next few saw days some people walk out uh, at points during the film i also thought it looked a little bit there was a there was a scene where it had a monkey with symbols clapping and a lot of doll heads. So I was feeling very Brothers Quay as well, because the junk actually could be turned into cooler junk. <laughs> yeah, D differently unsettling cool junk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, then these thugs like destroy. They're, yeah, the they just, religious zealots are. Uh... Show up actually in two movies so far that I've seen in post-apocalyptic, which uh, we will get to uh, later, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, that all sounds promising, um, except for one thing, which has nothing to do with the quality of the of the movie. It's uh, it doesn't sound very marketable, which makes me afraid that uh, it's not going to get a wide exposure. Um, but hopefully the right people will be able to find it. Uh, and it's maybe people who did the Wolf House. Right? Yeah, it's from the Wolf House. Uh, Wolf House broke through. Yeah, so so that that'll uh, that'll certainly help it. Okay. Next one, Josh uh, highlighted Ghost Cat and Zoo. I didn't see it, but I heard it's amazing. Okay. Did you hear that from anyone other than me? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But Giles has really word. been uh, Giles has really been going to bat for Ghost Cat and Zoo. Um, next, a, a movie that we talked about quite a bit last week. Uh, Chainsaws were were singing. Yeah, I saw that. You saw. <laughs> <laughs> it has some of my favorite moments where people explode. Definitely, by far, um, the musical pieces well composed definitely unique lyrics uh it's a love story yeah to some extent uh it's estonian it took 10 years so i feel like all those things make up a very pretty package i'm really glad i saw it although uh i showed it to my partner and they were like no i don't want tickets for that <laughs> <laughs> i think it was a little too goopy yeah he's uh he, yeah i saw him with another movie that was much less goopy and uh, observed that uh, that's not what he's about no he didn't like goopy things so but i like goopy things and you know there were a lot of bodily explosions there were these two blonde guys with a baby they were some of my favorite characters yeah they were really dumb but they were great really dumb and i don't know if it was a translation issue or a uh, screenwriting ambiguity built in uh, there was various points where I thought that they might be the brothers, brothers. Yeah. but that was, uh, yeah, that uh, I never quite um, landed on that uh, as, you know, necessarily true or not. So. Theirs was a love story as well. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's the evil mother. There's the evil mother. The cannibal evil mother. So, you know, you can't forget that there's not only a chainsaw-wielding maniac with mommy issues, 
which obviously nods toward Texas Chainsaw. Oh, it definitely nods, almost falls on its face toward Texas Chainsaw. But, you know, then mommy is definitely a cannibal as well. So family dynamics too. So this uh, this uh, movie had, had a lot of things going on it on in it. Yeah. I, and I can tell you, Pete uh, wants to see it because he posted. He, although he hasn't seen it, he's posting stills from it on Twitter. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I I did notice the uh, one pose with the guy on all fours and oh, yeah. uh, has a chainsaw on his butt, and the guy is giving the look to the camera. He's got the most exaggerated porn stash ever. Yeah, and he's giving a look to the camera that's exactly the look you would expect if you were distressed about a chainsaw going everybody. It, so it's... um, I, I, that's, that's that's a very telling still. The director said something about that was the one person who got injured during the shoot. Okay. <laughs> during the Q and A, he said, but I don't remember if he said how. They I, got it injured. was unrelated to that brief scene. Right. Uh, Thank. But... Thank goodness. <laughs> but yes, the way they filmed this was very guerrilla style because the, the director, uh, Sandra Moran, uh, of his various influences, uh, not only mentioned uh, El Mariachi from Rodriguez, but the book that Rodriguez wrote about making that and the, you know, uh, Rodriguez's his own trials and tribulations to get that picture. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, well, not quite legal and uh, certainly all friends and townsfolk banding together to help out shooting this back. Home. Yeah, lots of family too. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, the next one Giles recommended was uh, Infinite Summer from Yanso, our friend uh, Miguel Yanso, uh, who did oh. Jesus Shows You the Way to the Highway, which was a huge hit on our site and with our uh fans who often bring it up uh nina did you see that one i didn't but i'm a huge fan of jesus so not the not the god guy but the, the, <laughs> the one who shows you the way to the highway the show me the way to the highway that the, yeah, guy. the more immediately helpful one <laughs> Uh, however, reading Giles review, it suggests that this is much uh, different tone, not uh, not a goofy uh, throwing everything at the wall kind of comedy, but more of a serious science fictional comedy. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed I didn't see it because it has drugs, right? And I'm a big fan of the uh, alternate reality from psychedelics kind of narrative. Yeah, there, there's a there is a whole lot of that. Certainly, uh, the main agent of at least the main human agent of that is uh, they go so far as he's called Doctor Mindfulness and nice. he's uh, <laughs> spreading the word of this um, new wellness procedure. New, new wellness, yeah. <laughs> program that uh who, whose exact um origins are not ever made terribly clear but uh yeah there there it is a lot less silly um uh with my brief interview with uh, miguel on so i got the impression that that was kind of difficult for him to do uh he, he remarked that uh, jesus shows you the way to the highway is very much more the kind of thing he likes to do and feels you know that uh, he's capable uh, in doing it. So this was him trying to, I think, branch out while exploring the same theme. So you think he's trying to kind of garner more mainstream success? I I mean, it, it's there's a chance of that, but uh, this is, uh, I'm going to say it's not the biggest chance. He's got his own, you know, existence so he's a film professor, actually. Is his uh, really? yeah, is his is his nine to five, I believe. Where? Uh, he's been he's been a film professor in Ethiopia, Estonia, and I think probably in sections in Madrid. So he's you know he, he's a teacher who yeah makes yeah that pays the bills sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a second Estonian connection of the day, yeah. though yeah. I think kind of kind of tenuous with. Miguel Yanso just happens to be, you know, posted in mm -hmm. Estonia, not a native Estonians. But the Estonians, for such a small country, uh, have put out some weird ones because they also put out um, uh, November and the uh, Giles, the one about the monk and the uh, yeah, Soviet the Union. The Invisible Fight. 
Invisible Fight, yeah, recently. I so, love November. November's so, amazing. Uh, Estonia, for such a small country, is is hitting weird above its weight. Um, <laughs> so that I say, good on you, Estonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep them coming. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> We're all pro Estonia. Um, <laughs> next one is The Tenants, the Korean black comedy. I didn't see it, but I wanted to because I want answers to who's living in the bathroom. <laughs> and it's black and white. I'm a sucker for that as well. You know, I mean, I'd much rather watch something pretty with no narrative than kind of okay with a great narrative. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, got, uh, you know, with the black and white especially happening, there's a real noir feel going on to it. Um, the mm, different kinds of ornateness exhibited by the newlywed couple in the form of the taller, uh, older, slightly older guy with a crisp suit, beautiful long coat, almost always has his gloves on, almost always has this great fedora on with these uh, two, two, feather. two feathers <laughs> flanking it, uh, giving him this uh, uncanny antenna look wherever he's walking around and his like, wife who looks to be two to uh, you know over two feet shorter than him uh <laughs> clad in this very you know korean traditional garb with her hair done up in the you know high style and uh that deep uh cheek pinching smile of you know polite uh -huh. salutation uh -huh. almost you know her only expression there so it's uh, it's got a strange look strange premise and an almost perfect ending before, uh, for one reason or another, they either second guess themselves or my pet theory is uh, what whoever the producers were might have um, pressured the director into opting for a somewhat uh, saner ending than we got. But it's still a decent ending and the uh, overall experience was uh, very stylish and very strange and all virtually all in one apartment in one small section of an office with uh, smoke breaks outside in a park kind of thing. So it's a, yeah, three very uh, distinct spaces that all look different. Do they all feel claustrophobic too? Uh, certainly the office and the house did. So yeah, the, the moments of freedom, I guess, that uh, for the audience and the characters in question are in this little, little park section that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we can all get a breather there. <laughs> All right, let me move on and attempt to pronounce this. <laughs> I uh, think, Giles, you know what's coming up, uh, but I'm gonna, I mean, for fun, I'm gonna attempt to pronounce it because my bad pronunciation is kind of a running joke. I can't pronounce anything in any foreign language. Uh, Kizu Mono Gatari, colon, Koyomi Vamp. Kizu yeah. Mono Gatari. I think that's Is it Japanese. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> Koyomi Vamp. Uh, okay, Nina, did you see it? No. Okay, uh, Giles, anything quickly to say about that? Oh, uh, just, uh, yeah, very quickly, uh, my, my review. It's, uh, yeah, a Godard Plimpton co production of an anime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, that's the <laughs> one. Um, so it's anime guy becomes, uh, uh, you know, kind of the prototypical uh, male kind of schlub uh, protagonist uh, becomes a vampire and is tasked with collecting all the missing limbs of the female vampire who he desires and who who uh, made him a vampire. Correct, basically. Yep. Basically. Why are limbs missing? Uh, he, 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 well, I guess to, to hint at that, he has to get these back from a trio of vampire hunters that uh, she had a dramatic encounter with. Oh, okay. They, they are named uh, Dramaturgy, Episode, and Guillotine Cutter are their uh, character names. So I like that. <laughs> Sounds pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. I I wasn't really expecting it to be, but then it, it was. So, yeah. <laughs>
Uh, Giles uh, gets a lot of exposure to anime here at the festival and probably uh, nowhere else, but you'll probably over the years you've accumulated a big, a, big a uh, library of, of rare anime as uh, anybody, while probably missing most of the like what's considered classics. Never, ever. yeah, I, I have seen, yeah, the, the only let's see, I've seen Vampire Hunter D. Uh, I seen. Oh, what's the one with uh, the the superannuated uh, children? Oh, it's uh, the main character is Tetsuo Akira. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I guess uh, shoot the, the tentacle one. I I hunted down the the rare um full cut. Overfiend. Yeah, the over yeah Legend of Hiratsuka Doshi. Yeah, Legend of the Overfiend. Mm. Sounds like. Did you did you ever see Attack on Titan no, or any of those? No, I, I have missed such impressive swaths of classic formative anime that uh, but, you I'm know, amazed and ashamed of myself. You're watching weirdo anime. Well, yeah. I'd rather watch weirdo mm -hmm. anime. Oh, yeah. anime is so huge that you would basically you would you could watch a different series every day of your life, and still by the time you died, you'd seen a tiny corner of anime. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one reason I'm not particular. Yeah, I, yeah, that is exactly why I'm not terribly self conscious about right. it. But, it's a uh, Sisyphean task yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I needed to start decades before I was born. So, yeah. Yeah. I will often say something, um, even sort of mildly dismissive about anime, or you know, imprecise or incorrect, and uh, the. Fans will definitely jump on me on the blog if I say something that's that's incorrect and correct me, and they have every right to do that because uh, <laughs> you know yeah, they, I they know uh, yeah they're they're uh, the knowledge I've seen from them is uh, well earned I'm sure none of us none of us make that our specialty we try to incorporate it and then um, you know other people are gonna who know better are gonna lecture us and that's okay you got to learn to. Uh, to love the audience's corrections because it makes you smarter. But <laughs> we do have one last movie uh, that I believe you both have seen that Giles recommended. And oh, this yeah. one, unlike the rest of them, all of which, you know, their um, distribution is going to be questionable, might take a while, might not come up. But this one you can definitely see. It is Cuckoo. Oh my god! <laughs> I like cuckoo. I'm not sure. I am obsessed with that movie. Okay. I, we walked out. I thought, wow, this one is definitely an apocryphal candidate, and mm -hmm. now I can't wait to see it again. <laughs> have, have you seen my review of it yet, Nina? No. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I I quote you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, okay, I guess that's it on Cuckoo. Now, um, uh, <laughs> I will uh, just say it, it was picked up by Neon and uh, is actually um, going into th theaters, I believe, next week. And um, I think our guest last week was referring to uh, the fact that uh, Neon may have been trying to get it pulled from the festival lineup. And uh, uh, that was... Or was that a different one? That was a different one. Was that Shelby Oaks? Shelby Oaks, I know. Yeah, yeah. Shelby Oaks was the uh, thing that uh, whoever was behind that. Mike uh, Flanagan. I, I've heard yeah. different rumors about Neon vis-a-vis uh, -vis Cuckoo, which I think I sort of hint at in my review uh, regarding um, whether or not we're getting the full Tillman Singer experience that we might have otherwise. What? <laughs> there's like a director's cut there. well i don't well it's more that it may not have been filmed i don't know this uh i only uh, I heard, heard little little bits of this that it's like as with any uh uh upgrade in um production to you know working with an actual you know production and dis distribution group uh your a director's vision is going to be better funded but oftentimes more curtailed oh do you think that but he had final cut, right? I have no idea. About oh no! That. But uh, that said, yeah, I still think it's uh, 
a work, a masterpiece, work of genius, uh, so much fun, gorgeous to look at, acting. I mean, Dan Stevens as Herr Koenig, my goodness. <laughs> He's really rocking that German accent in a way that is uh, super awkward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Delightfully super awkward. Hilarious too. Oh. He's he's always sotto voce, like whispering in people's ears in this German accent. Very funny. Definitely, yeah. Keep, keeps the creep. Yeah, he starts the creep from the beginning and just keeps it going the entire thing without going too far, which uh, I imagine is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, um, well balanced. But uh, and and the young woman, Hunter Schaefer. Hunter Schaefer was just pitch perfect. Uh, as very annoyed 17 year old girl kind of semi hijacked by her, her her new family to live in this really really crummy looking alpine resort for purposes it always feels like with Tillman Singer's films that he shoots everything in this like 70s 80s retro atmosphere even though it's contemporary so Everything looks a little bit worn, a little bit out of date, and the resort is definitely not a resort I'd want to stay in. I mean, actually, I, I wouldn't as a general rule, but seeing as it it looked very, uh, like, thorough, like there were bunches of these little lodges around this, you know, part of the, the Alpine Bavarian area, and I got to wonder if that place actually exists, I might want to stay there just to, you know, be on the the larger set of uh, cuckoo for <laughs> for you know that kind of experience. Wow! Uh, it was it was neat, and the sound design. I was so glad to have seen that movie in a good theater with Throw all the appropriate uh, speakers around. It was just so uh, amazingly clever, and envelops you in it with the different things he's doing with sound you know both with the score with uh changes in source with the whole premise of the problem as it were and the the horror element the uh you know those things that are there mm -hmm. is just uh don't want to give it away oh yeah but it, it was <laughs> it was just on the best it was on a very good side of overwhelming for me yeah there were moments where i was like who's talking I would be looking around and I'd be like, who's talking? And then I thought, oh, it's it's the surround. It it is so immersed me that I feel like there are people Aww. around all around me talking. It was really intense. Yeah. Really intense. And I'm now fascinated by this bird. Oh, the the namesake bird. The cuckoo, yeah. Because I oh. how do I I didn't know anything about it beyond it comes out of clocks and it's <laughs> noise. It's a pretty bird and it warbles while it flies and it never sings cuckoo till the first day of July. Is that? Uh, that's a that? blues song. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> I doubt, I doubt it's a reference, but. Uh, I would have been really uh, impressed if you made that up on the fly, though. <laughs> I'm impressed that he was uh, quoting an old blues song. So, yeah, yeah. I am impressed. Too. Yeah, this was, yeah, there was a similar theme uh, in Vivarium a few years back that. Uh, first raised my awareness of the pernicious uh some of the pernicious tendencies of that, that particular cuckoo. bird also uh the cuckoo is uh uh referenced in um the wicker man in one of the songs loudly sing cuckoo which is from an old english ballad so it has a connection to paganism yeah and yeah so, so yeah, also, also the root of the uh, word cuckold. Oh, yeah, that well, makes that's a cuckoo it, trivia. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when you say it goes into the themes of of the cuckoo bird, in other words, you're talking about its uh, its nesting behavior, the way it just yes. robs another bird yes. of its nest and kicks those eggs out, lays its own eggs there, and then the parent bird is stuck raising this huge cuckoo chick. Yeah. When uh, when they should have been raising their own checks, yes, yeah, that's that's one of the things I'm big fan. And it's not really behavior that's isolated just to the cuckoo. I think there's other birds that are 
that are uh, that are basically uh, basically squatter <laughs> squatter species. I can believe it. There are I there are lots of birds out there, but the cuckoo is the only one that uh, I've, I've now seen two movies that uh, you know reference it specifically. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> so, like in uh, that one, will be in theaters again, uh, and I will get to see it because it's from Neon. I get to. Neon is very good about providing us all screeners at awards time, so we get to see everything from Neon. Um, oh, lucky you. That sounds fun. But, uh, yeah, join a critics group. And, uh, um, <laughs> well, oh, is there anything in the short time we have remaining outside that eight movie list, Nina, that you would particularly like to recommend that you saw? Uh, Parvelous. Yeah. Marvelous. Um, by someone named Esbon, I believe. Uh, so Parvelos is a coming of age story set in Mexico in the post-apocalyptic time after a global pandemic where they happen to drop some uh, vaccines off and the vaccines caused a mutation where I... I kind of don't want to give it away, but you know, there's some kind of zombie action. Yeah, yeah that's pretty. Movie. That's pretty. Yeah, they they make that. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty clear. From it's so gorgeous early. to look at. It's desaturated. Very desaturated. Yeah. Almost black and white. Um, poignant and funny and equal balance so that you're really enjoying both of those things and then you can get to enjoy the uh the funny and then all of a sudden it'll become very very unsettling so you know the plays plays with the it's mood super very capably. Tense too yeah. i mean i was <laughs> white knuckling <laughs> It start. There's just this one scene involving earthworms very early on that I was just like, eh, and then you know after that I was just constantly gripping the armrests in hmm. hope, fear, suspense. It was anticipation. Anticipation. Yeah. 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 And I see you got some other things you uh, you you meant. Oh, you. Uh, I recall you like cryptic. I did like Cryptic a lot. So Cryptic was directed by a woman, Courtney Roy. Uh, in, in the Q&A, she talks about uh, she really wanted to make a movie about mucus monsters. And let me just say, she succeeds <laughs> with bells on. There's some weird time loop kind of things going on. And there's a kind of cryptozoology aspect to it because there's this creature called the suko who ends up um kind of devouring people in a vaginal way yeah kind of devouring <laughs> yeah. kind of having sex with yeah them. yeah and yeah it's uh especially creepy guys who deserve it yeah i, I wasn't uh, dismayed by any of the victims uh yep getting what was coming to them yeah i think people were kind of psyched about it yeah so. Cryptic was one of the ones that I suggested Giles check out, and he um, did a little capsule review with the notation that uh, he thinks uh, somebody else should look at it and might appreciate it more, basically. Yeah. <laughs> that person's me. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it was the kind of thing that was really uh, on the edge for me, whether to be a candidate or not. So yeah, definitely wanted a second set of eyes in uh, the weirdness regard. Yeah, I I think it is pretty weird, but it's not as weird as something like Cuckoo, mm. yeah. which, you know, wears its weirdness on its sleeve. Whereas I think Cryptic, it, it actually has some kind of serious drama involved, I think, yeah. as well. Okay, well, we have a little less than two minutes off because our my timer's not quite uh, right. Um, but uh, so I'm going to, before I forget, mention that uh, next week on Pod 366, Giles will be back home in Troy, New York, correct? Yep. And we will have as a guest, Case Esparos, the director of The Absence of Milk in the Mouths of the Lost, a very low budget surrealist feature. Um, mm -hmm. 
Jowson, you are right there to ask our guest a final closing question. Well, Nina, we like to wrap up every interview with our guests with this. What's your hometown, and can you recommend a restaurant there? <laughs> All right. My hometown actually went bankrupt, so it used to be Prospect, <laughs> New York. But uh, it went bankrupt and it became a Remsen. And we had a glove factory there. I mean, it's super rural. I would say there is no restaurant in my well, former you're in hometown. Connecticut, so. Well, oh, you mean there? Well, you okay, yeah. so Chester, Connecticut is where I live now. And I would say the Village Bistro is amazing. They have a great brunch and uh, really good food. Excellent, because we're about out of time. So that's the Little Bistro? That's the Village Bistro. Village Bistro. In Chester, I, Connecticut. Chester, Connecticut. And tell Chelsea I sent you. Okay, tell Chelsea you get a discount. All right, thank you, <laughs> Nina, for showing up. Uh, we will be back mm -hmm. next week with Case Esparos, and I will have been with Pete before this. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. All right. <laughs>